we're going to go back and revisit this optical illusion. Just, we've already done it once, so just stare at it for a few moments, just so you can experience it again, and then we'll try to explain why it is what it is. Remember, I, d I wasn't sure this was going to work, so I'm kind of happy that it, di that it did. Ready? I'm going to try to explain a little bit of why that effect happens, and then this little kind of like excursus, little like rabbit trail about light, it actually does come back to the, to the atom, so it is applicable. But here's what's happening in your eye, things that you don't even think about, things that you've experienced your whole life and so you've never really thought, hmm, I wonder how that works. Maybe you've heard it before, but not something to think of often. Here's a picture of the light, of the eye, excuse me, with light hitting it, so you've got this hole in the front of your eye, right? Lens does all this focusing and directing. Basically light passes through your eye to the back of your eye where it impacts the back of your eye and you have different types of receptors in the back of your eye. We've got what are known as rods and cones. Rods are primarily used for low level light for black and white. So your night vision is primarily coming from those rods. As a matter of fact, the rods are displaced, and if you, you, there's a blind spot in your eye, that's where the optical nerve is at, where you can't see really well. So at night, have you ever noticed that you see better peripherally than you do straight on at night? Like military patrols and things like that, we're taught, for example, you know, we're on a patrol and we hear this loud noise, which is probably someone like yourself trying to be sneaky, so it's a loud noise crunching something or like that. Okay, so when you look to that direction, if I stare straight at where I think the sound is coming from, there may be something there that I can't see because I'm directing that vision straight back into my either the blind spot or where the rods are not as concentrated. But if I look away, like if I intentionally look off to the right or to the left, whatever's in my peripheral vision is easier to see at night. Okay, so little hint, at night, trying to see something, don't stare at it. Look off to the side a little bit and observe it in your peripheral vision. Okay, so the rods are the apparatus that God has given us so that we can see in low level light and primarily in black and white. That's why at night even things that are in color appear black and white because those rods that are receiving that energy are transmitting it to our brains in black and white. So these cells are getting a signal. The light energy is hitting them. They're taking that light energy, they're converting it into a signal and sending it to your brain. Your brain is receiving the signal and translating it into something that gives you a thought. So when you see something, it's actually a multiple step process of communication between the energy hitting your eye, your eye converting that energy into a signal, that signal going to your brain, and then your brain understanding it and reinterpreting that signal as something. In addition to the rods, you have cones. Cones are for colors. And you have three different kinds that see red, blue, and green. Depending upon the intensity and the color, different cones, well, let me put it this way. Different cones see the different colors. A blue cone doesn't see red and green. It only sees blue. So each cone is designed for a particular color. And then when it receives that color light, it sends a signal to the brain, and the intensity of that signal is based upon the intensity of that color that your eye received. So what we have going on here is this combination of intensities of all the different colors that exist by the apparatus in your eye detecting it, seeing it as red, blue, or green, and then based upon the intensity of it, sending an appropriate signal to your brain, your brain then takes all those signals and mashes them together. And so when you see a yellow color, what you're actually seeing is your brain putting together signals from the red and signals from the green and saying, I see yellow. But from your eye, all that's saying is, I see red, I see green. The brain puts it together to see yellow. The brain puts together blue and red to make magenta, puts together green and blue to make cyan, puts all the colors together to say white. If all my cones are popping away saying, yes, bright, 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 I'm getting bright red, bright green, bright blue, my mind says, that's white, and brings it all together. So what was happening 
with that last, uh, with the X, with the red X. What happens in your eye is, as you're looking at something and your eye is sending, let's say we see red. We go back to that X that was on the screen. You see red, okay. That means that the cones in your eye that are receiving red send a signal to your brain saying, I see red, I see red, I see red, I see red. After a period of time, they stop sending signals altogether. They just stop. What your brain figures out is, if I'm not getting a signal, that means nothing's changed. So your brain fills in the color without getting the signal from your eye, okay? Your brain is saying you're still seeing red. Even though your red cones have stopped sending the signal to your brain, that you're seeing red. So your brain works off changes. So the image red stays even though the signal for red stops. But when the red X goes away and there's white again, now that place that used to be solid red has a different signal to your eye. Your, your, the the um, cones in your eye have to kind of wake up. And then as they wake up, they start sending signals to your brain again. Your brain says, okay, something's changed. And in that period between sleeping and wake up, or resting and wake up, however you think about it, is that time when you see the optical illusion of the different shadings, the different colors, those kind of things that happen on the screen. That's because your cones are waking up and starting to send signals to your brain. So anyway, that's the idea that the colors that you see, the actual shadings, different variations, are all... Signals of the red, green, and blue receptors in your eyes sending signals to your brain and your brain merging them together. And your brain also, because of that, that you know, the effect we saw from the X going away, is that the, your brain, after a while, those cones that are sending the signal to your brain, they stop sending. Your brain assumes that nothing has changed, so they keep that color in your, in your thought. You know, you see it even though it's no signals coming. And then when something changes, and those cones have to wake up, it takes a, a time for them to start sending a new signal to the brain, which causes what you were seeing to slowly fade away or change in all the different optical illusions. And it's slightly different for different people. If you're prone to color blindness, it doesn't look the same for you. That's why I'm not reading real specific on, did you see and telling you exactly what you're supposed to have seen? Because it's a little bit different for everybody. All right. What does that have to do with Grandpa Niles? Niels Bohr. It's actually pronounced Niels, I think. Niels Bohr. Just shown here, like, uh, I love that line at Crash Course Chemistry. It says, it says, wicked math chops. We're talking about Heisenberg. So I always like pictures where someone's showing some math. Yes, that's not a foreign language. That is math. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, there's a younger picture of the guy. More about the time when this work was done. Here's how we use light, and we're talking about the atom. What Niels found out, he took hydrogen gas. Took the hydrogen gas and excited it. Basically, we use the word excitation, and de-excitation means we're adding energy to it. We're adding, in this case, he added, let's say he added an electrical charge to it. He gave energy to the hydrogen. And it was observed that there was electromagnetic radiation coming off of that. The EM, what's another name for EM? Waves, right? In this case, it was light. It was in the visible spectrum. So there was light coming off. They took that light, and it appeared a light purple color. But we're savvy enough now to know that light purple isn't light purple. Light purple is made up of a combination of multiple colors. Also means multiple wavelengths, right? So by sending that light purple light through a prism, able to break it up into its component pieces, these four distinct wavelengths of light were discovered. 410, 434, 486, and 657. Now if we put that on a color with some color spectrum, look familiar? So we've got Roy G. Biv. Here are where the different frequencies lay out. Notice that they're very specific frequencies. There's not this broad range of colors. Four very specific frequencies, in this case shown as wavelengths. So four very specific of wavelength of light 
we're coming off of the hydrogen, the now de-excited hydrogen. 410 was violet, 434 is indigo, 486 is blue, and, four, and 656 is this orangish red. And so what that showed, this point for our discussion of the atom, is that atoms emit individual, very discrete, range, and not general ranges of light. There's very specific wavelengths that come off. Now we've talked about Planck's constant in energy, right? So energy is Planck's constant times frequency. In other words, the energy coming off is directly related to the frequency, higher frequency, higher energy. And frequencies are directly related to wavelengths. So very specific frequencies means very specific wavelengths, means very specific colors, means very specific energy amounts. Okay. If there was a range of colors, like a big broad somewhere between here and here and all of these colors, we would say that a generalized range of energy was be being given off. But what this shows is that there's very specific energy is being given off. A very specific color, one, two, three, and four in this case. And so that may not strike you as being important, except Bohr looked back at the model of the atom and said, oh, wait a minute. If we've got this idea of a nucleus and atoms rotating around the nucleus and looking at hydrogen, Hydrogen is the simplest atom we can look at because it has a proton in the nucleus. It has no neutrons. It only has one electron. It's just two pieces, electron and proton. That's all it is. Okay. So if I have hydrogen and it's giving off energy and it's giving off very specific energy, something very specific and very quantized. Quantized means chunks or packets. You can't take part of it. It's either all or nothing. Kind of like if you think of these as stair steps. By showing four different energies, it's four different steps that we can take. Ever walk down the step and take half a step? Ever, what happens when you take half a step? Some of you have experienced it, maybe others not so much. What, what happens when you take half a step? You fall, right? The idea here is when the energy comes off the atom, it comes off in very specific steps. And what Bohr was, did was said, wait a minute, if we have a nucleus and we have a rotating set of electrons, the energy that's coming off must be coming off from somewhere, and when it's coming off, it's coming in off in very specific steps. And what he did was he expanded the idea of the atom, whereas before all of the electrons would be considered to be rotating in a single orbit, and he laid out the different orbits. First orbit, second orbit, third orbit, and fourth orbit. And what he said was, what's happening here is that the electrons that are being excited when we add energy to it, they're being, they're being excited, they then also then become de-excited. Now think about it. Energy goes into the atom and we've got electrons that are absorbing the energy. When these atoms absorb the energy, what Bohr said was they'll move from whatever orbit they're in to a higher orbit, a higher energy level. Why would they do that? They've just received energy. Because of that, they go to a higher energy level. But one of the things we'll talk about in more detail tomorrow is called ground state, that all matter wants to be at its least energized level. It wants to get rid of that additional energy. So what he said was, energy comes in, hits the electron. The electron goes to a higher orbit, farther from the nucleus. When it does that, a fraction of a second later, it then falls back in. It de-excites. And when it falls back in, it gets rid of energy. And when it gets rid of energy, it emits it as a photon. And that photon comes off with a particular wavelength based upon how much energy it gave off. How far did it fall? Did it fall one step, two step, three steps, or four steps? And if it fell those steps, it had to give off that much energy because energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. It's giving off a specific amount of energy, so it's giving off a specific frequency, which means it's also a specific wavelength, which means it's a specific color. So Bohr came in, and here's basically what it looks like. Energy comes in, hits an electron. The electron is excited, so the electron moves to a higher energy level, a higher state. Think of it as an orbit farther from the center. 
So energy comes in, electron absorbs it, it moves to a higher energy level. Then, since it doesn't want to be at that energy level, that's one of the things I like about chemistry is we personify things, you know? Like I say here, but you know what? The electrons are like slothful young people at home. They'd rather just lay around on the couch all day. I come home and say, cut the grass! So I excite them and they get up and get moving, but as soon as they can, what do they want to do? Go back to the couch, right? Or go back to the YouTube or whatever. So electrons are much the same way. They are ha you know, fat, dumb, and happy, just orbiting around the nucleus until some outside motivation comes in, excites them. They get moving for a minute, but as soon as they can get away with it, they go back to where they were. When they go, but in order to go back to where they were, they've got to get rid of the energy that excited them, so they have to be de-excited. And that energy that they release when they drop back down is what gets emitted as a photon of light energy. Cool? Okay. So we not only figured out that when these electrons were being excited and falling back, but they, f they went to very discrete locations. Again, because light was being returned, being emitted at very discrete amounts. He said, well, there's a first energy level, there's a second energy level, third energy level, and so on. But an electron can't be excited and go to a one and a half energy level. Because if it fell from a one and a half energy level, it would give us a different frequency of light. We don't get that. We get very specific amounts of light, which means there are very specific distances from the center. There's only certain paths that can be used. And the electron has to be in a path or in a lower path or in a higher path, but it can't be anywhere in the middle. And that's kind of where I said the other day about what's kind of cool about this is that a particle can be in this orbit or this orbit, and when it's in a lower orbit and gets excited and moves to a higher orbit, it ceases to exist in one orbit and simultaneously automatically exists in the next orbit without there being any place where it exists in between. It's kind of, think of it as being beamed to that location. Now, this is all going to break down when we move into the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Because the quantum mechanical model of the atom moves us away from the idea that an electron is a particle and into the idea that the electron is actually the result of waves. The duality principle. Okay. But for right now, we're still looking at, and we're going to still consider, even though we're going to say that electrons are primarily the result of interaction of waves, we're still going to treat them like particles because frankly it starts to blow your mind when you try to figure out these things as the wave functions as opposed to location of particular particles. Now, I have a brief video that's going to go through and, and explain this one more time. Frankly, I thought this was going to take a lot more time and I hope I didn't just like bust through it because of the adrenaline from what happened out in the hall. But We'll find out, because I don't have a lot more planned for today. I was actually hoping that I'd give you some time to work on homework and ask some questions maybe from the homework that you've all turned in. Did anybody, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but you know, if there's serious questions that we got from the homework that you still have, I'd rather answer them now to maybe help you with upcoming homework rather than let you continue on in your misunderstanding. So are we good with that? What we're gonna see is a video, and the video portrays a couple different ways of looking at the atom. It's gonna describe the um, the Bohr model, then it's going to have a stair-step model. And when you see the stair-step model, what I want you to think of that as, like the Bohr model here has rings, the stair-step model has a level here, 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 and here. Just think of it as, think of it as this area above here. So there's, there's an energy level that would be here, an energy level here, an energy level here. And it's just showing the different levels, the different steps that the electron can be in. Then on the far side, on the right-hand side, they're going to have a an attempt to represent the quantum mechanical model, which we're going to move into tomorrow um, and start talking about the QMM, quantum mechanical model. And that's where we go to the idea that electrons are not actually particles, but they're the interactions of waves and that they don't orbit, but they exist in orbitals or clouds and they have no specific location, but there's a probability of their location. And so what we try to represent is the probability not the actual location where they're located. But for right now, let's go ahead and see if this video will work for us.
So what they're trying to show there is electrons are being hit with energy, going to a higher energy level, then dropping to a lower energy level, and as, as they drop, or another way to think of it, to enable them to drop, they have to release energy, and they release it back out as light. Okay. So, Go back to one more time. If you noticed on that stair-step model, let me back up just a minute, that because the, a because the electron can only exist here or here or here, it can only drop from here to here or drop from here to here. The amount that it drops indicates how much, how much energy it has to give off, and that amount of energy that it gives off comes off as a frequency of, of light. Now, this is used in spectrometry. It's one of the ways that we figure out, for example, that there's a planet or a star or something out in distant from us. What is it made of? How do we know that this star we're looking at is so much hydrogen or so much helium or whatever the gas mixture may be? How do we know? And part of the way we know is the color of the light that's being emitted from that star, that celestial body. It's emitting certain, certain colors. And the colors that it's emitting are very particular to certain elements. So we can take an element, we can excite the electrons in it, we can look at the discharge, the, when it, when it de-excites, when it comes back down, it emits this energy and based upon the color of light, the spectrum that come out, we can identify what the element is. So we can do it remotely with spectrometry. We're not going to watch the movie again. I'll leave that up on the screen and take any questions you may have had from homework. Any concept questions or anything like that you have for me?